Happy Tuesday. No bunny today, I promise. Chicks, Chicks maybe, <laughs> candy. Uh, a couple of updates for all of you uh, at the top. Uh, we provided a bit of an update on what the Jobs Cabinet uh, has been up to since the President announced the American Jobs Plan last week, so just wanted to provide you a little bit more of an update. As we noted yesterday, they've been hard at work throughout the congressional recess, making calls to Democratic chairs and Republican ranking members of the relevant committees and to appropriators. They've led briefings for major House and Senate caucuses. Uh, the uh, Secretary Buttigieg will meet with the moderate New, Dem New Democrats caucus this week. Uh, the Office of Public Engagement will lead calls throughout this week with private sector, rural and agricultural stakeholders, climate groups, local chambers of commerce, faith leaders, minority leaders, community college groups, and more. And the Office of Legislative Affairs is coordinating about 30 briefings for majority and minority committee staff of committees with jurisdiction over the American Jobs Plan. These efforts will continue, of course, when members return to Washington. And as I noted yesterday, the President looks forward to welcoming members to the White House. And as we have that locked in, we'll provide more details to all of you. Uh, today, uh, Vice President Harris joined the COVID response team's weekly governor's meeting to discuss our country's pandemic response, the progress we've made, and the work to come in our fight against the virus. The Vice President highlighted the country's work in the pandemic response to date, including today's announcement that the President will, uh, will announce officially later this afternoon that we've reached 150 million shots in arms since entering government, and that by April 19th, all adult Americans will be eligible to get the vaccine. That doesn't mean they will get it that day. It means they can join the line uh, that day if they have not already done that beforehand. She also noted the important work to come, in particular around ensuring access to the vaccine in every community and building confidence in the vaccine in every community. She highlighted best practices to ensure equity remains at the cornerstone of our vaccination effort. She also touched on the $3 billion in funding, largely from the American Rescue Plan, that will enable states and cities to support community-based organizations in launching new programs to increase vaccine access, acceptance, and uptake. And there was some more news today about how that will be distributed and used. Uh, she's also in Chicago today focusing on vaccine equity. In Chicago alone, the CDC will invest $33 million to support efforts to increase vaccine distribution and access with a specific focus on communities of color. Also today in his weekly update, so part of the same call I should say for clarity, uh, COVID response coordinator Jeff Zients announced there will be more than 28 million doses across channels this week. Cumulatively over the past three weeks, we will have sent out nearly 90 million doses of the vaccine. He also stressed to governors uh, that while we continue to make strong progress, it is critical that we continue to mask up and socially distance. Josh, why don't you kick us off? Thanks, Jen. Uh, on the vaccine and vaccination announcement, uh, we've kind of known for weeks that you'd see this ramp up in production. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, why move up the timeline now? Is there a desire to make sure that people who are hesitant or reluctant to get a vaccine feel like they can do so? What's the thinking there? Well, first, the president had already announced that he was asking states to move up their timelines. Uh, so this is more uh, providing clarity to the American public who uh, may tune in to the president's remarks or clips that you all share on the news that they're all eligible. It cre provides clarity. Uh, it reduces confusion. Uh, and it ensures that Americans who are not yet vaccinated, who are looking to get vaccinated, they know they are all eligible, all adults, I should say, on April 19th. And then uh, secondly, it's been about a week since the president announced his infrastructure plan. Mm -hmm. Lots of states, county cities are wondering how they would qualify for any money. Do you have any details on what that process would look like? Sure. Uh, well, first, uh, ultimately, it will be up to Congress and something we'll have a conversation with members and committees about. That's part of the why it's so important to engage at a committee level and staff level. And many of you who have been through uh, a journey like this before know this, but let me just reiterate some of the pieces of the process. Uh, funding for transportation process uh, for transportation projects can typically be allocated through two different types of grants, and we expect a mix uh, to be discussed, either formula grants or competitive grants. So formula grants are allocated to states based on certain criteria. 
like the number of miles on an interstate highway or a population in a given urban area, most of our existing transportation funding flows through formula grants, which gives states a lot of flexibility on how to prioritize and spend their federal dollars based on what their needs are. Competitive grants are a more targeted way to direct funds to specific policy goals, often based on criteria set by Congress. For example, the popular Tiger Grant program uh, that was set up in the Recovery Act considered how a project con uh, could contribute to job creation, and that was one of the big factors that was determined as uh, programs were being or states were applying for funding. We've also mentioned uh, the administration's proposal for a competitive grant program to fund 10 of the most economically significant bridges in the country. So that type of application would be through competitive grants. Uh, so again, this is something that we will be working through co with Congress, with committees of jurisdiction. Though it will be a mix of those two type of grants would be our expectation. And as states who all have excellent questions, including local reporters we engage with, that, that is what they can expect in terms of the process. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. The FBI keeps a watch list with information about people who are known or reasonably suspected of being involved in terror activities. Two people on it from Yemen have been apprehended at the border. How concerned is President Biden about terrorists possibly trying to take advantage of gaps in the border to get in and kill Americans? Well, first let me convey that uh, these type of incidents are very uncommon. Uh, and CBP and DHS can speak more to uh, the timeline uh, and the specifics, of course, in, in these particular cases and encounters. But encounters of known and suspected terrorists are very uncommon. Uh, they do underscore the importance of the critical work that is done on a daily basis to vet those at the border. DHS works uh, not just in, at the border, uh, as you know, but also with international partners to share intelligence and other information, including to prevent individuals on certain watch lists from entering the United States. They adjudicate individuals encountered at and between ports of entry against several classified and unclassified databases. So while this is rare, this is a reflection of them doing their jobs. Another quick one about the border. The DHS secretary is reportedly looking to finish some gaps in the southern border. How does that fit with President Biden's day one executive order to stop border wall construction? Well, wall construction remains paused to the extent permitted by law. So some has already been funded through uh, congressional uh, authorization and, and funding allocation. Uh, but as agencies uh, develop for a plan, uh, it's paused while agencies are develop developing a plan for the president on the management of the federal funds. When the administration took office, as you referenced, funds had been diverted from congressionally appropriated military construction projects uh, and other appropriated purposes toward building the wall. And wall construction was being challenged in multiple lawsuits, in, for, for much of the wall, I should say, not all of it, by plaintiffs who allege serious environmental and safety issues. Under those circumstances, uh, federal agencies are continuing to review wall contracts and develop a plan to submit to the president soon. It is, it is paused. Uh, there is uh, some limited construction that has been funded and allocated for, but it is uh, otherwise paused. And then, uh, is the White House concerned that Major League Baseball is moving their all-star game to Colorado, where voting regulations are very similar to Georgia? Well, let me just refute the, few, refute, uh, the first point uh, you made. Uh, first, let me say, um, on Colorado, um, Colorado uh, allows you to register on Election Day. Uh, Colorado has voting by mail, where they send to 100 percent of people in the state uh, who are eligible uh, application to vote by mail. 94% of people in Colorado voted by mail in the 2020 election. Uh, and they also allow for a range of um, uh, materials to provide, uh, even if they vote on election day, for the limited number of people who, who vote on election day. I think it's important to remember the context here. Uh, the Georgia legislation is built on a lie. Uh, it's, there was no widespread fraud in the 2020 election. Uh, Georgia's top Republican election officials have acknowledged that repeatedly in interviews. Uh, and what there was, however, was record-setting turnout, especially by voters of color. So instead, what we're seeing here is in, for politicians who didn't like the outcome, uh, they're not changing their policies uh, to win more votes. They're changing the rules to exclude more voters. And we certainly see the circumstances as different. But ultimately, sorry, let me add one more thing. It's up to Major League Baseball to determine where they're holding their all-star game. Okay, a quick one from a colleague who could not be here. Uh, you're talking about the new vaccine eligibility deadline. Mm -hmm. Is the supply ramping up 
quicker than expected? And if not, what does moving the eligibility deadline up actually do in practice? Like, are more people going to get vaccinated faster? That's our hope. Absolutely. And we have expedited the supply. So there's been nearly 90 million uh, doses uh, provided to states in just the last three weeks. And that certainly is an increase over the weeks prior. That's part of it. But also we want to provide clarity. We're at the point with our supply and with our distribution uh, to states that we think um, you know, it's time to provide that level of clarity. Now, it's not just about the vaccine supply. We've also increased uh, the number of pharmacies, more than doubled the number of pharmacies that are distributing the vaccine. We've also increased our um, commitment and our funding of uh, community health centers, of mass vaccination sites, because we also know people need to have places to go, mobile vaccination vehicles, et cetera. All right. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kelly. Yes. On the vaccines, is this about leading uh, governors to move more quickly, or is this about reacting to what governors have already done? Because most states had already moved their eligibility. Mm -hmm. and it sort of seems like the president is now affirming a date that for many people was already the real And he had called for them to move this date forward a couple of weeks ago. So uh, he had also called for the date to move forward uh, from May 1st as well. So uh, he is certainly uh, confirming for the public that uh, everyone is eligible around the country. That is a great deal of clarity. They don't have to go to their local state website and see when they're eligible. They know that they are eligible on April 19th. Every American out there who is not vaccinated. This is also um, part of the effort here and part of what he'll be conveying later today is to communicate to seniors and people who have seniors in their community, maybe members of their family, this is the time to go now to ensure seniors who are your loved ones, your family members, people in your neighborhood to go now because the lines are going to become longer. There are going to be more people waiting. Uh, so he'll also be sending that clear message. So this is more about public education than accomplishing a particular goal. Is that fair to say? Well, we, we certainly wouldn't be at this point had we not uh, purchased enough supply to vaccinate every adult American, had we not increased our uh, uh, the number of vaccinators who can distribute the vaccine, put them in shots and arms, and had we not massively increased our investment in places where people could go. So it's a signal that, one, we're delivering clarity, but also we are at a point where there are enough, there's enough supply, there are enough vaccinators, there are enough um, vaccination sites that every American uh, adult is eligible April 19th. That is a accomplishment for the medical field, it's an accomplishment for the people who are running the operational piece, it's an accomplishment for the, um, you know, uh, the, the medical experts locally who are running these programs in different states. Briefly on Georgia, when uh, the president voiced his support uh, for moving it, does he have any regret now that by doing that, by adding his voice, it may have contributed to the environment where MLB makes this decision and then there are these economic consequences? to people in Georgia when he and the vice president were there and couldn't do the car rally and I mm -hmm. talked about wanting to thank Georgia. Georgia's been important to the president and vice president electorally. Um, is there a sense of regret that perhaps he tipped the scale uh, with his rhetoric, uh, even if he doesn't have a direct uh, cause and effect? Well, he was answering a direct question during an interview with ESPN about the opening day baseball, something everybody, mo not everybody, most people in the country appreciate and enjoy. And he was simply conveying that he would support that decision if that decision was made by Major League Baseball, just like he would support decisions made by private sector companies. We're not standing here and calling for companies to boycott. Um, that's not what our focus is on from the White House. We do believe that um, the focus on Georgia and is a reminder that, and it should be a reminder, I should say, that um, this is much bigger than Georgia, that Georgia was just one of the first states to act on a concerted effort to use easily disprovable conspiracy theories to fuel their attempts to make it even harder for eligible Americans to vote. But according to the Brennan Center, uh, as of March 24, 361 bills with restrictive provisions have been introduced in 47 states around the country. So this is not just Georgia. This is something we are seeing a prevalence of this, a pattern around the country of, uh, you know, an effort to make it more difficult to vote. Mitch McConnell, a Republican leader still in Kentucky, said uh, many positive things about the friendship and personal relationship mm -hmm. he's had with the president uh, for a long time, a fine man and so forth. Also says a moderate he is not. Does the president still identify as a moderate within the Democratic Party or do you feel that he has moved more or does the president feel he has moved more to the progressive wing of his own party? 
I don't think this will surprise you, but the president is not eager to be labeled by anyone in his party or certainly even by his friend Mitch McConnell. And he is now president of the United States. He governs for all Americans. Uh, he is encouraged by, we all are encouraged by, the openness we've heard from uh, some who would identify as moderate Democrats or Republicans of discussing components of the package that he has proposed. And he's looking forward to having that conversation. Go ahead, Jen. Um, two questions on the Federal Reserve Board. Is there any update on the um, effort to fill a vacancy, the, the, the vacancy on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors? I don't have any personnel update for you. I'm happy to check and see if there's any update we can provide. Thank you. And then also, has President Biden spoken to the Federal Reserve Chairman yet, Jay Powell? I don't have any call to read out either. So you can't say if they've spoken yet at all? I, I don't have any update on it. Let us know, please, if you can. I, I absolutely will. OK, thank you very much. And then also, um, uh, one other question about phone calls. Has President Biden spoken to President Obama about how to pass the infrastructure bill? Has President Obama given him any advice on how to pass that bill? They speak regularly. Uh, they, of course, were president and vice president, but they are also friends, and they share a bond of serving through eight years of the Obama-Biden administration, but uh, also a personal friendship and kinship. Uh, and he speaks with him regularly, but uh, we're not going to read out those calls. Go ahead. Jen, you went through some of the numbers on the increase in supply and the pharmacies, yeah. but kind of following up on what um, Kelly had been asking too, do we, should we look for the president to maybe move up that July 4th circle date that he had said about Americans being able to gather uh, in small groups? Can that also move up now, given that the eligibility is moving up by two weeks and the pace of vaccinations is increasing? Well, we're certainly encouraged by the fact that we are um, vaccinating, our team is vaccinating, our Experts across the country, I should say, are vaccinating an average of about 3 million people a day, which is uh, far uh, larger than any other country in the world. Uh, but we know that it's not just about having the supply or eligibility. It's also about uh, people in the country, eligible adult Americans, going to their community health center, going to a mass vaccination site, going to a pharmacy to get vaccinated and get that shot in their arms. So. Uh, any changes we would make in advising the public, we would certainly do in, in uh, close coordination with the advice of the CDC and our health and medical team. I don't have any expectation of that at this point, but we're always looking at how we can provide clarity to the public. And you had said that you know, the, the lines might start getting longer, so seniors should start getting their shots now just to make sure they're not doing it when it gets clogged up. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned that because the eligibility has expanded, that the supply can match that, that you can still be on pace to vaccinate all American adults who want it by the end of May? We will have enough supply by the end of May, um, and we certainly uh, remain confident that we will continue to be able to uh, provide uh, the supply that states need to vaccinate uh, people in their states, and we'll continue to uh, provide supply also uh, independently to the pharmacies, which is a place, a program that has started out as a pilot and has been incredibly successful. So we are confident in, in what the path looks like ahead. but. We also uh, constantly contingency plan. We know things happen. Uh, as trucks break down. There are issues in manufacturing sites, as we saw just last week. And we are constantly contingency planning about steps we need to take to ensure we have adequate supply out through all of our programs. The president continues to urge Americans to be vigilant. We expect he'll do that today in his remarks. Mm -hmm. But over the weekend, we saw Americans traveling for the holiday weekend. We saw it totally packed baseball stadium in Texas mm -hmm. yesterday. Basically, there are Americans across the country who are doing exactly what the president is telling them not to do. Mm -hmm. Is the message, are Americans not hearing this, or are they hearing it and ignoring it? You know, I think the president recognizes that this has been a long and difficult journey for the American public. Uh, we've been, uh, the country has been shut down in one form or another for more than a year now, and people have missed birthday parties, weddings, baseball games, uh, going out to restaurants. It is difficult, it is hard, and what he's asking people to do is to sacrifice a little bit longer. Uh, and he will continue to make that case and make that argument. Now, while we saw uh, the, the baseball game, as you, as you noted, and other events over the weekend, and we certainly anticipate it as it, the weather gets warmer, there will be a temptation. We've also seen communities where local mayors, businesses, have conveyed to their uh, communities that we need to hang together, we need to remain vigilant, we need to wear masks, uh, and we, we will get through this together. So we are hopeful that, uh, that that's exactly what the majority of communities in this country will do. Go ahead. Thank you. A um, couple of clarifying questions just on the, the vaccine stuff. Mm -hmm. One. Does this change the date at all by which there is an expectation everybody is vaccinated? 
I mean, does, does that move up? Is there a, it does they have a sense of how they expect everybody to be vaccinated? Well, uh, in getting to a point where the majority of the American public is vaccinated is about more than supply. So what this announcement is conveying is uh, we are at a point with the supply we have available, the number of vaccination, the vac vaccines, vaccination sites, vaccinators, where we believe everybody in the country should be eligible, can get in line by April 19th. Many people will have been in line or will even be vaccinated, as we've seen by the numbers before then. But it is going to take the American people going, uh, masking up, socially distancing, and going and getting vaccinated. We're going to make that as easy as possible. But there are roles that we can play, and then there are roles that the public have to play. My question is, once they get in line on the 19th, by the 19th, how long that line ultimately may be? There's not a new update on that. I don't have a new update on that. I, I think it's just important for clarity purposes to convey. It doesn't mean everybody will be uh, vaccinated by April 19th, which is, I know why you're asking the question. It means that everybody will, will be eligible to uh, go to their local pharmacy, go to their community health center, mobile vaccination site, mass vaccination site, on that date and moving forward. One more unrelated to the vaccine. Um, over the weekend, there was reporting that at Guantanamo, a facility was closed and some detainees were consolidated. Mm -hmm. Is that indicative at all of the Pentagon's review of closing Gitmo, of the president's plan and in a timeline to, to potentially make that proposal to close Gitmo? Uh, the president remains committed. Uh, that is his desire and the outcome he would like to see. Obviously, that process would be overseen by the Department of Defense. Uh, so I would refer you to them for more specifics about that, those moves and that announcement. Go ahead. Um, so another uh, foreign policy question. Uh, president Zelensky of Ukraine, uh, he has said publicly that um, that country needs to join NATO to avoid um, a war in the mm -hmm. Donbass region with Russia. Uh, we know that he brought that up on his call uh, mm -hmm. with the Canadian Prime Minister. Did he bring that up with President Biden on their recent call? Um, and uh, I guess more importantly, uh, what is the President's view on that um, issue? Well, um, one, uh, that has long been the um, aspiration of Ukraine, uh, and one that has been raised in a range of conversations uh, with U.S. officials over the course of several years. I would defer to them. We would, of course, defer to the Ukrainian government on reading out uh, what they raised um, on the call uh, with the president. Uh, but you know, in addition to uh, we're we're all in addition to our reassurances uh, that are consistently made uh, to Ukrainian officials of our support for them and support for their sovereignty. We're also discussing our concerns about the increase in tensions and the ceasefire violations, regional tensions with NATO allies, uh, and certainly would, uh, would, would uh, be here to hear from them, as we have for years, about their aspirations and the process they need to go through. But as far as uh, an official White House position on whether they should be able to join NATO soon, is there a position? Again, it's been an aspiration of Ukraine's for some time. We've long uh, been discussing that aspiration with Ukraine. We are uh, strong supporters of them. We are engaged with them uh, in working to push back on the destabilizing actions. Uh, but uh, that's a decision for NATO to make, and we'll continue to be uh, you know, uh, recipients of their interests. Okay, and you said uh, a minute ago that uh, the Georgia voting rights law was based on a lie. Mm -hmm. We had a, a poll yesterday that showed that m more than half of Republicans uh, believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump and that the Capitol riot was led by left-wing agitators. Um, is there a public policy response to disinformation? Well, first, um, to disinformation in general. Uh, look, I, I think that um, the prevalence of disinformation is something that is of concern to the president. Uh, he believes there is uh, a range of um, reasons for it. Some relate to the platforms. Uh, some relate to the uh, individual actors who are promoting and provoking uh, destabilizing activities and actions through their rhetoric. He's spoken to that in the past. Um, you know, this is certainly uh, an, an issue that the president is focused on, and he will. Uh, work with his team on, on addressing through policy uh, measures, but I don't have anything to preview for you. Okay, just one more quick thing on the American Jobs Plan. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a Moody's estimate that you have cited. Um, it, basically, their estimate is that 2.7 million jobs will be created mm -hmm. over 10 years as, if that plan is passed um, as it's been proposed. Um, I think that works out to something like $850,000 per job. 
Given that, are you open to ideas uh, about a, a more targeted way, a cheaper way of achieving the same goal in terms of number of jobs created? Well, we're always open to hearing from members of Congress and on their ideas and what they think should be a part of the package. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the President's red line is inaction. Uh, he won't tolerate inaction on rebuilding our nation's infrastructure, something that has long been outdated. He believes that we need to uh, invest in that so we can improve the lives of ordinary Americans and make it easier to do business. Uh, he also believes that invest investments in long-term economic growth will create good paying jobs. Uh, there was another study that showed that about 75% of these jobs, a Georgetown study I should say, uh, would go to workers who did not have college degrees. And that is certainly uh, a population in this country that needs uh, extra assistance and it, it would be highly targeted in helping uh, give a leg up to people who need that help. Uh, he also believes that we need to invest in order to help us uh, outcompete China uh, and invest in our own emerging economies to do that, and that we need to invest in the American people, that the American people are the backbone of our nations, of our country, and that is part of our uh, proposal in this package. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, just two questions. Um, one on vaccine again. Um, is there any thought being given to a federally organized vaccine passport of some kind? Does the president see that maybe as some kind of tool that could be used, or would he lean more on the side of people who have raised objections over privacy and so on? Well, let me be very clear on this. I know there's been lots of questions. Uh, the government is not now, nor will we be supporting a system that requires Americans to carry a credential. Uh, there will be no federal vaccinations database and no federal mandate requiring everyone to obtain a single vaccination credential. As these tools are being considered by the private and nonprofit sectors, our interest is very simple from the federal government, which is Americans' privacy and rights should be protected and so, the, so that these systems are not used against people unfairly. There is a movement, as you know, in the private sector to identify ways that they can return to uh, events where there are large swaths of people safely in soccer stadiums or theaters. Um, and that's something that, uh, that's where the idea originated and we expect that's where it will be concluded. We will be providing um, some guidance which will look like an FAQ, uh, a frequently asked question, I hate acronyms, but uh, that provides important answers to questions that Americans have in particular around concerns about privacy, security, or discrimination uh, soon. I don't have an exact date for that yet. Okay, and if I might, another question uh, on Iran. Uh, it's pretty clear what the carrot is for Iran. Mm -hmm. That's obvious. Uh, but given that the previous administration, you know, just battered them with pretty much everything it had, apart from war, um, what's left uh, in terms of the stick when you're, in, when you're entering these negotiations? What, 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 you know, what, what, what is left actually apart from war? What, it, what would Iran want out of it? Is no, that what I'm you're saying, asking? What's the stick? You're coming with a carrot, right? Which is, you know, we'll bring you back in and so on. You dismantle all this stuff and, you know, we'll eventually give you sanctions relief. That's pretty clear. But they withstood the sanctions under the Trump administration. And, you know, they, they in fact only increased their activity in the nuclear. Well, field. if you, so if you go back, if you go back historically just a few years before the Trump administration to the Obama Biden administration, sanctions were put in place, which incentivized in many ways getting them to the table to have the discussion about the joint plan of action. So, look, I would say at this point, uh, today's the first day of discussions. Uh, as you know, these discussions are happening uh, in Geneva, and uh, they are happening through our European counterparts and partners. We expect them to have difficult portions. We expect this to be a long process, uh, and we, uh, you know, continue to believe that a diplomatic path is the right path forward, uh, and there are benefits to all sides. When the Trump administration pulled out of the joint plan of action, what they left us with is a, a far decreased visibility of Iran's nuclear capability, uh, of what, of, of uh, inspections at their sites, uh, of an understanding of how close they were to acquiring a nuclear weapon. That's not in anyone's interest, certainly not the American people. Go ahead. Uh, Jen, um, Senator Schumer's office said last night that the Senate parliamentarian had ruled in favor of additional uh, reconciliation bills. Uh, I wondered if the administration have any view on that ruling. And in light of this ruling, is this the likely path that the president will take with the Senate in terms of getting this infrastructure bill across the finish line? 
Well, the president continues to believe, uh, less than a week after he announced the plan, I'll say, that there's a bipartisan path forward. And we are encouraged, uh, not just by 80% of the public that believes that we, it is long overdue to invest in infrastructure, that not just roads, rails, and bridges, but there is a way we should, uh, the federal, a role the federal government can play in rebuilding the infrastructure of our economy and helping support American workers for the 21st century. Uh, this is a mechanism, as, as you know, reconciliation is a mechanism for passing uh, budgetary uh, bills in Congress. Um, we will leave the mechanisms and the determination of the mechanisms to leaders in Congress. But right now, less than a week after he announced the American Jobs Plan, our focus is on engaging with Democrats and Republicans, with staff, with committee staff, inviting members to uh, the White House next week. And we are encouraged uh, by uh, some of the statements that have been made about components of the package where we could find agreement. In, on infrastructure, some Republicans have quibbled with the way infrastructure should be defined in the bill. Does the president feel he has to convince Republicans of what should uh, be used in an infrastructure bill before he can actually persuade them to vote for it? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a homework assignment. Um, there are some Republicans who have previously called for investment in workforce development as part of comprehensive Im infrastructure investment. Some have called for that. Uh, some have previously called for investing in broadband and the expansion of broadband as a means of expanding infrastructure. Uh, some ha even have a uh, reference to replacing pipes as a means of infrastructure. Uh, so I would suggest that many of their constituents would be surprised to hear that those are not infrastructure projects. And I'm sure with a little Googling, you can all figure out who those all are. Just uh, go in the more. back. Hi. Um, at this press conference, the president said our children and grandchildren will be writing doctoral theses about uh, whether democracy or autocracy succeeded. Uh, what, what's his own measure for success there? Is it American GDP versus Chinese GDP ultimately, or is it uh, the sphere of influence of both countries um, around the world? It's a big, broad question. A good one. Um, look, I think the president is, uh, when he talks about that, he's not just talking about economic growth and development. That certainly is part of it. He's also talking about our values. Uh, and what message we send uh, to the world and to our children. And so it has quite a broad meeting. And that's, I think, reflective and reflected, I should say, in how he has approached his presidency and identified the crises we're facing. You know, I think he wants, he has grandchildren now. So maybe he wants the rest of us to be able to tell our grandchildren what role did we play in addressing racial injustice? What role did we play in addressing the climate crisis? What role did we play in helping rebuild the workforce of the future? And what role did we play in standing up for our values around the world? So has quite a broad meaning, um, uh, but you know, I think that's a reflection of his approach to his presidency. Is he using the competition with China point uh, as, a, as a sort of key selling point with Republicans on, on infrastructure and, and, and perhaps in a way that an appeal in other areas is not going to work? The, the idea that there's a danger of falling behind China, is he, does he hope pragmatically that will strike a chord? Well, there is agreement across Democrats, Republicans, frankly, the American people, that we need to do more to invest here at home in order to compete with China. And uh, he has conveyed, too, that his, and I have, I guess, as well, that uh, our approach to our relationship with China is to come to that relationship from a position of strength. And that includes investing at home, ensuring that our workforce, our infrastructure, our broadband access is at a rate where it would, uh, com it would, it would strengthen our own infrastructure and workforce here so that we can compete, compete globally. Uh, there's also been uh, proposed legislation, I'm not sure if it's been formally dropped yet, but to um, by Senator Schumer and others that is focused on how we can better invest in our workforce to compete with China. We anticipate there's an opportunity for that to be bipartisan because investing in, workforce, in our workforce here is something that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. Just one quick other thing, is the president disappointed by the pace of vaccine distribution in the District of Columbia, and does it potentially strengthen the argument for statehood? 
Well, he's spoken about statehood in the past, but I would say that uh, you know we track every community, we track every state and locality, and how distribution is going, and how to improve it and make it more effective. And we work very closely with leaders. One size doesn't fit all, uh, and some in some cases that means we increase distribution to pharmacies, we increase distribution to mobile vaccine sites, and so that's certainly something that's ongoing with leaders around the country, including, of course, uh, with leaders in the District of Columbia. Go ahead, in the back. Oh, go ahead, Nadia. Oh, thank you, Jen. I want to follow up on the Vienna talks. Um, so I, is the White House satisfied or content by this first round of talks between what they call the P4 plus one and Iran? Well, we're only on the first day. So I will, I will allow the team that is negotiating on the ground to give more of an assessment of how they feel the talks have gone. Can you explain if these talks are indirect between the Europeans, the Russians, and the Chinese, and Iran, why do you have a high-ranking US official in Vienna since you don't want to talk directly with the Iranians? Well, I think it's important to convey to the, our partners, our P5 plus one partners too, that we believe diplomacy is the best step forward, is the most appropriate step forward. And Rob Malley, who is somebody who's experienced, who's uh, been a part of negotiations in the past, is uh, certainly an appropriate level individual from the government to be there. So is the White House position till now that no lifting of any sanctions until Iran complies? Well, I think we expect that, as I conveyed yesterday, that a big part of the conversation will be uh, how Iran can come back into compliance and what would be required of the United States. But uh, we've been clear uh, that we are um, not taking, not anticipating any uh, steps at this moment. We'll allow the negotiations to, to continue. And allow me on Iraq. Tomorrow, uh, you're going to hold the strategic dialogue between mm -hmm. the United States and Iraq. Um, as you know, the president has been talking about reviewing troops numbers all over the world, including Iraq. Is this a, a topic that obviously high and center on these talks? What do you expect from these talks? How are they different from the previous one under the previous administration? Well, one, uh, these meetings will further clarify that coalition forces are in Iraq to, at the invitation of the Iraqi government and solely for the purpose of training and advising Iraqi forces to ensure that ISIS cannot reconstitute. And I think that's a difference from how it was described previously. This will also be an important opportunity to discuss our mutual interests across a range of fields from security to culture to trade and climate. Uh, and obviously these are proceeding soon and I'm certain we'll have a readout once they once the, the discussions conclude. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, Bloomberg reported earlier today that President Putin plans to take part in the virtual climate summit later this month. Has the Kremlin reached out to confirm his attendance? I'm sorry, say the last part one more time. Have, has the Kremlin reached out to confirm his attendance? Uh, we've invited about 40 heads of state to attend the climate summit, and I expect as we get closer, we'll have confirmation about who will be participating in the summit. Okay, and one more. Uh, Senator McConnell's comments yesterday to encourage Republican men to get, go get a vaccine. Um, was the White House in touch with Senator McConnell uh, in, as part of the effort to address vaccine hesitancy, or was the president in touch with him before he made those comments? I don't have any private conversations to pre or to communicate about, but certainly we see it uh, as a positive for any member of Congress, a Democrat or Republican, to be out there advocating for their supporters, uh, people who follow them, who listen to them, about the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, go ahead. Thanks, Sean. Um, following up on some of what Ken was asking about sure. reconciliation, um, for there to be a sort of second bite at the reconciliation apple, so to speak, it would have to be by the end of this fiscal year. Um, and concerning what you just said about President Biden being the only red line is in action, does President Biden see there being any deadline for Congress to move on the jobs plan? Would you like to see it by the end of the fiscal year or by the end of the calendar year? You'd like to see progress by May and certainly a package uh, through by, by the summer. And then um, on uh, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, we're getting very, very close to the May 1st deadline uh, to pull out the remaining 3,500 mm -hmm. troops. Um, it doesn't, frankly, look like the White House is going, or the administration is going to meet that deadline. Um, why, at this point, should the American people have confidence in your ability to finally end this war if you're not going to meet sort of this initial deadline? 
Well, first, it wasn't a deadline we set, um, uh, but the president, this president, uh, has conveyed that it would be difficult operationally to meet the timeline of getting all troops out by May 1st. He has also consistently, over the course of the last decade, spoken out about his concerns about the war, uh, and that has consistently been his view even back when he was vice president and it wasn't aligned with everybody else in the administration. So that should hopefully give people confidence about um, his commitments. Um, but it's also an important decision, one he needs to make in close consultation with our allies and also with our national security team uh, here in this administration, and we want to give him the time to do that. Go ahead in the back. Good afternoon. Uh, what does the president, who we know is Catholic, uh, say to Catholic doctors, Catholic institutions who are fearful that if the Equality Act passes, it has the potential to trample on their conscience rights. What does the president say to those people who are concerned about that? He has a difference of opinion, and he respects their difference of opinion, but uh, he has been a supporter of the Equality Act, uh, and he also is a practicing Catholic and attends church uh, nearly every week. Go so ahead, Kelly. Can, can oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, separate question here. Uh, Chicago saw 131 homicides through March of this year. Last year, this time, 98. The White House's reaction to that number, and then is there anything the federal government is planning or willing to do to step into the city of Chicago and tamp down the deadly violence? Just recently, a 13-year-old boy was shot and killed there. Well, um, I appreciate you raising the fact that there's a prevalence of violence, sometimes at the hands of guns, uh, something the president has uh, fought for throughout his career, which is uh, ensuring that uh, we put in place more gun safety measures. We work with communities to invest in community violence prevention. He's actually proposed funding to do exactly that, something that many groups support because they believe in order to reduce violence, in order to address the prevalence of violence in communities like some in, in Chicago, uh, that we need to spend the money from the federal government to do exactly that. Put any resources right now, immediately, rather than waiting for laws and waiting for uh, you know community events or what have you to take place. People are dying on the streets by the day. I, again, I appreciate you raising it because some, one thing we don't talk about enough is the fact that beyond mass shootings, there are additional people who die in cities, sometimes young kids, nearly every single day as a result of violence. He has proposed funding. Uh, we would support acting on that, and that's what we'll continue to advocate. But I think we got to move on. Go ahead, Kelly. Is the administration uh, looking at how you're going to talk about the number of jobs created from the infrastructure package? Because citing the Moody's numbers mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Secretary Buttigieg and Brian Deese talking yeah. about 19 million, when that was really talking about a much longer time frame. Mm -hmm. So since you aren't giving us administration-centered numbers, how can you add some clarity to where the numbers uh, for jobs should be if uh, the Secretary and Mr. Deese overshot in their comments. Well, I think as the Secretary said in an interview yesterday, it is important to be clear and to be specific about jobs numbers to provide clarity to the American people. And it will be hard to have state by state. We'll have state by state fact sheets out soon, I think, but it'll hard, be hard to have state by state job creation numbers because we won't know the specifics because of all of the bidding processes that will take place as it relates to infrastructure. But Moody's ran an analysis that showed that the economy would create 19 million jobs over the next decade if Congress passes the American Jobs Plan almost 3 million more than if it doesn't. So that is the that is what the impact would be of the American Jobs Plan, 2.7 million to be totally clear. Um, these are millions of jobs that won't be created if Congress doesn't act to pass this plan. We see that as a positive, but we also uh, will be very clear and articulate exactly what numbers of jobs it will create. Thanks, Thank you, everyone.